This video is part three of a review of unit seven, which is all about the applications of the theorems of calculus. If you haven't seen parts one or two yet, go ahead and go back and watch those first. You'll find the links in the description. For number 11 and 12, consider function f given by f of x equals 4x cubed on the interval from 1 to 3. Note that f is continuous and differentiable for all real numbers. Number 11, f is continuous and differentiable, so the mean value theorem for derivatives guarantees that there is some c with c between 1 and 3, or f prime is equal to what? Fill in the blank with a number, then find the value of c. I said the mean value theorem for derivatives, but I could have just said the mean value theorem. The key is that f prime at c will equal the average rate of change for some value c. So we're using this formula. In other words, f prime at c will equal this expression for some value c. Here's function f right here. So f at 3 will equal 4 times 3 cubed, which is 108. Similarly, f at 1 is 4 times 1 cubed, which equals 4. Substituting these values into the expression that we have for f prime at c gives us this. So f prime at c will equal 104 divided by 2 for some value of c which means that f prime at c will equal 52 for some value of c. This is the number that goes in the blank right here. f prime at c equals what? 52. Now we need to find the value of c guaranteed by the mean value theorem. So we need to find f prime and set it equal to 52. Well, here's function f. So the derivative will be 12 x squared. Well, we want to do f prime at c. So let's do 12 c squared. And that should equal 52. Dividing both sides by 12, we have c squared equals 52 over 12. No need to turn this into a decimal. We don't have a calculator. Don't spend the time. So we get c is equal to the square root of 52 over 12. Normally, I would say plus or minus the square root of 52 over 12, but they gave us this interval from 1 to 3 that we have to stick to. And negative radical 52 over 12 would be outside this interval. So this is the final answer. Number 12, f is continuous. So the mean value theorem for integrals guarantees that there is some d on the interval from 1 to 3 where f at d is equal to what? After we find that value and fill in the blank, we will then find the value of d. According to the mean value theorem for integrals, if f is continuous, then f at c will equal the average value of f for some c. So in this case, f at d will equal this formula for the average value of f on the interval from 1 to 3. 3 minus 1 is 2, and dividing by 2 is the same as multiplying by 1 half. I'm going to write it this way to save a little bit of space. Remember that f of x equals 4x to the third power. So in order to evaluate this definite integral, we need to first find the antiderivative of f. Increasing the exponent by 1 will give us x to the 4th power. But then dividing by that new exponent cancels out the 4 in the front. So we just have x to the 4th power. Applying the limits of integration from 1 to 3 reminds us that we need to find the value at 3 minus the value at 1. So I brought down the 1 half. Here's the value at 3 minus the value at 1. That's one half of 81 minus one. So that's one half of 80. So f at d equals 40 for some d on this interval. And that's the number that goes on this blank.
f at d is equal to 40. Now we need to find the value of d guaranteed by the mean value theorem for integrals. f at d equals 40 means if we substitute d in for x, it should equal 40. In other words, 4 times d to the third power should equal 40. Dividing both sides by 4, we get d to the third power is equal to 10. Taking the cube root of both sides, we get d is equal to the cube root of 10. And that's the final answer for number 12. For number 13 to 15, a particle moves along the y-axis. The table below shows its acceleration a in feet per second per second at various times t measured in seconds. At time t equals 0, the particle's position is y equals 4 feet, and its velocity is v equals 3 feet per second. For all t greater than or equal to 0, the acceleration function is continuous and differentiable. Number 13. Approximate the integral from 0 to 8 of a of t dt using the left-sided Riemann sum and the three subintervals indicated in the table. Then, using correct units, interpret the meaning of this integral in the context of the problem. The three subintervals indicated on the table are from 0 to 2, 2 to 6, and 6 to 8. So we have this. The idea of a Riemann sum is that we will use rectangles or sometimes trapezoids to estimate the area under a curve. In the case of a left-sided Riemann sum, we will use rectangles drawn so that the left side of the rectangle touches the curve. So I could use this purple rectangle to approximate the area under the curve from 2 to 6. To find the area of a rectangle, of course, we need the base times the height. The base of the rectangle will be the width of the interval. So from 2 to 6, that is 4. Similarly, uh, for the rectangle representing the first interval, the base would be 2. And for the third interval, the base would be, again, 2. The height of this rectangle is going to be the value of the function on the left side of the interval, because the height of the rectangle is equal to the value of the function because the rectangle touches the curve on the left side. So I need the value of the function at 2, which will be 5. So this will be the height of the rectangle on the interval from 2 to 6. Similarly, I will use the value of the function at 0 and the value of the function at 6 always the left side of the interval because this is a left-sided Riemann sum. So the value of the function at 0 is 2, and the value of the function at 6 is again 2. The area of each rectangle is base times height. So the approximate value of this integral is going to be 2 times plus 4 times 5 plus 2 times 2. This turns out to be 28. But what are the units? We are supposed to describe the meaning in context anyway, so it's time to talk about that. We know that the integral of a rate is the change in amount. So, for example, the integral of velocity will be the change in position from 0 to 8 in this case. Similarly, the integral of acceleration will be the change in velocity from 0 to 8. So because we are talking about the change in velocity, the units will be in feet per second. The units of velocity. So here is the interpretation of the meaning in the context of the problem. The net change in velocity from t equals 0 seconds to t equals 8 seconds is 28 feet per second. Number 14. 
use the values given in the table to approximate a prime at 1. Well, a prime is the rate of change of acceleration. So this means the instantaneous rate of change of acceleration at time t equals 1 second. We don't have enough information to calculate the exact instantaneous rate of change of acceleration. For that, we would need to have a function for acceleration that we could maybe uh, plug into a calculator or substitute the value for 1 into the function and see what we get. So the best we can do is approximate. So instead of calculating the instantaneous rate of change of acceleration, we'll approximate using the average rate of change of acceleration. For the average rate of change of acceleration, I need to do a at something minus a at something divided by something minus something. In other words, what interval should I use to approximate the rate of change at 1? Well, the value of 1 is right here between 0 and 2. So to approximate the rate of change of acceleration at 1, let's use the average rate of change from 0 to 2. So we will do a at 2 minus a at 0 min, uh, divided by 2 minus 0. a at 2 is 5. And a at 0 is 2. So we have 5 minus 2 divided by 2 minus 0. That's going to be 3 over 2. Let's talk about the units for a moment. In the numerator, we have the change in acceleration. And the units of acceleration are feet per second squared. In the denominator, we're talking about times. This is time t equals 2 minus the time t equals 0. So the units of the denominator are seconds. So overall, we could describe this as feet per second cubed. So the instantaneous rate of change of acceleration at 1 is approximately 1.5 feet per second cubed. Number 15. Does there have to be a time t on the interval from 0 to 8 when the graph of the particle's velocity has a horizontal tangent line? Justify your answer. When they are asking us if something has to exist, that's a big hint that we will probably be using one of our five existence theorems. Maybe it'll be the intermediate value theorem, or the extreme value theorem, or should we use Rolle's theorem, or perhaps the mean value theorem, or even the mean value theorem for integrals. Which one should we use? Let's focus on what it is we are being asked to prove. The velocity has a horizontal tangent line. So when you hear the phrase horizontal tangent line, you should be thinking the derivative is equal to zero. So if the velocity has a horizontal tangent line at some c value, that means the derivative of velocity at c should equal 0. So this is what we are trying to prove. However, our data is in acceleration. We don't have velocity, we have acceleration. So how can we translate this into a statement about acceleration? Of course, we know that v prime is acceleration. So we can sort of throw out this statement and replace it with acceleration well, let me say acceleration at c is equal to 0. This is important because in this form, we can see that we are not talking about the derivative of the function that we are given. We are talking about the original function. So don't be confused. If you think about v prime, you're going to think we are probably going to use Rolle's theorem because the conclusion of Rolle's theorem says that f prime at c is equal to zero. 
let's replace f with v so we can really see what's going on. So we want to show that v prime at c is equal to 0 for some c. We can only use Rolle's theorem if we know the precondition. And switching over to v's, we have to know that v at a is equal to v at b. Looking back at the data, do we see two values where v at a equals v at b? Well, no, because this is a chart of acceleration, not velocity. So we can't see anything about v at a or v at b. Since our data is for acceleration, let's just erase the part about velocity for now and just ask ourselves, can we prove that the acceleration will equal zero for some value of c. If we look at it this way, then we see that we are talking about the original function equaling zero. It's not a prime, it's just a. For that reason, we will not be using Rolle's theorem, which requires the use of the derivative. Similarly, we will not use the mean value theorem, also derivative we will probably use the intermediate value theorem because the conclusion says that the original function will equal some value. For the intermediate value theorem to work, we need a value that is less than the target and a value that is greater than the target. We want to prove that the acceleration will equal zero somewhere. So I'm thinking of zero as the target. For IVT to work, we need a value of acceleration that is less than zero and a value that is greater than zero. Well, we have a value less than zero right here, and all of the other values are greater than zero. So, for example, I could just use these two values, one below and one above zero. So we can use the intermediate value theorem. We always have to begin with the preconditions. So we have to state that acceleration is continuous. Remember that we are given in the setup that the acceleration function is continuous and differentiable, but we're not going to talk about differentiable because for the intermediate value theorem, all we need is continuous. Since a of t is continuous, now it's time to state the second precondition we need a value that is below zero and a value that is above zero. And we're gonna write it as an inequality just like this. Since a of t is continuous and a at eight is less than zero, which is less than a at zero, optionally we can say by IVT, but we don't have to say that. Now it's time for the conclusion. There is a C in AB where F at C is equal to K. So there is a C in the interval from zero to eight where A at C is equal to zero. I would have given you full credit for this, but if you wanna be 100% sure of getting full credit on the AP exam, you might wanna tie it back to what they asked you to find by adding the statement so, velocity has a horizontal tangent line.